Welcome to Mysterious Universe, Season 31, Episode 15. Coming up on this show, we've got the secret cults of Cornwall, the enigma of the Phantom Pilot, and the time travel portals of Xenor. I'm your host, Benjamin Grundy. Joining me is Aaron Wright. Oh, I have alleged time travel portals, or portals to hell at least. We're on that path See today. how in sync we are? See how our periods just sync up? Every every Our month. paranormal periods are just completely <laughs> synced. Every the, month, the moon's in, sync. in the right position. Perfect. Yeah, that's great. What are you going into? Uh, I I was browsing through an old classic above topsecret dot com. Oh, I have, I have not been there, and so it went just so far nuts yeah, that I yeah, went. Yeah, yeah. I was, sitting, I was sitting there at my computer thinking, should I take my meds today or should I browse above topsecret dot com? And I just browsed browsed above, above topsecret dot com, and I came across this classic. The Curious Case of King Dog. This is an old thread. It's from May of 2011. And it's about a possible secret cult in Cornwall in the UK. You know where Cornwall is? Yeah, it's um, well, it's, it's like, on the coastline, isn't it? Yeah, it's the most southern tip of Britain. Okay. It's like right on the, the edge, the little pointy bit coming out of the... Southwestern edge. So, what kind of off the the coast of Ireland there, or facing? I've got a map. Just okay, yeah, that'd be for us idiots. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not very familiar. Where's my with map at all? Where's my map? There it is. Oh, there we see. Oh, yeah, I see. Right down the bottom there. Mm-hmm. And this thread is from someone who has lived there. His family's from there, and he he tells this intriguing story about this video that was being shared around. It's a home video, and it shows some kind of occult ritual that occurred in this area and he was introduced to this video and then all these strange things started to happen to him. Yeah, I was just thinking actually, wasn't there an owl man from Yes. Yeah, okay. But the owl man, which was reported on by John Downs. That's right. Yeah. I don't I can't remember the full story. We've spoken about it a bunch of times, but all this information just comes out of my head like a sieve. But uh yeah, from memory that was a sighting of a large humanoid owl creature near one of the churches there. Well, he had once- bright red eyes, it was witnessed by multitudes of people, and some of the theories were that there was some type of occult ritual or a conjuring which had released it into our reality. It's like a mothman kind of yeah. entity seen in in the UK. But once I started to look into this story on Above Top Secret, because it just looked like a throwaway thread. It just looked like, okay, maybe this guy's made it up and there's nothing to it. But it opened up this rabbit hole and I started to broaden my search to try and get to the bottom of what it was about, what this secret occult group was doing, what this this home video being passed around was, what it was for. And I discovered just the wealth of high strangeness that's obviously in that part of the UK. Yeah, very much so. And in particular, I found this interesting artist whose family has historically been gypsies. And uh, he told a story about his pet monkey in the 1960s <laughs> and then later on said that he has the ability to travel through time because of portals in Cornwall. So I was like, all right, I'm Definitely in. Definitely not going to take your meds. <laughs> I'm in. Yep. Okay. All right. What have you got coming up? Well, I went into Haunted War Tales, True Military Encounters with the Bizarre, Paranormal and Unexplained. This is by uh, R.C. Bramhall. Really well written. Uh, it's fascinating in the sense that uh, I think a lot of the authors – that have the best stories are ones that have gotten out there as you know, and are talking to people and people are approaching them with their stories. And he's had a bunch of veterans who have come forward and, you know, told them about their unusual experiences. And interestingly enough, uh, the book, as much as you would think it's focusing on high strangeness and paranormal, Mm. it's not entirely. There's a bunch of really fascinating stories, which I'm going to go into in the plus extension. This looked good, this book. There's a lot of stuff in there though, that was kind of like, oh yeah, it's, it's weird, Yeah, but it's not paranormal. Well, I started reading the first chapter. Oh, it's yeah, it's great. And then I thought, I'm, maybe I'll cover this for the show. But then I thought I'll message you and just see, just in case, maybe you're reading it as well. And you're like, yeah, I'm halfway through I'm it. I'm already halfway through it. Yep. Damn it. <laughs> no, it's okay. Because, I mean, some of the stories there start crossing into like uh, what appear to be phantom planes with strange pilots and uh, the uh, a new take on the rock apes and some of the mm. Vietnam vets and the encounters that they've had. He also references you know other reports that we we know reasonably well. Um, but then he's got things included in there of people encountering like uh, it, it's more gore. It's like the the soldiers in um and this is quite horrible. So sk- skip forward thirty seconds. But like soldiers in the trenches, for example, um being attacked by gigantic rats. And there was this one particular incidence of where how big are we talking? Oh, I'm talking like the size of a shoebox or a small cat or 
you know, even a little bit bigger, like these horror, but it all makes sense. Like rats, you know, given the opportunity and you've got all this flesh and blood everywhere mm. uh, across a battlefield that have no trouble in, you know, going there and, and getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, there's this one story of where a soldier wakes up to find like he'd left some chocolate on his chest or something and he wakes up and there's like a, a, a rat the size of a cat or a small dog sitting on his chest just eating it. But then he looks over or there's another scene where this guy looks over and he sees like these two cat-sized rats fighting over a disembodied hand. And like a horrible, gory kind of stuff. So I skipped over a lot of that, obviously. Did you do chapter three, the Nazi Necronomicon? I, well, I did. Yeah, I went into some of that Nazi stuff. But what it, it kind of led me to was actually this uh, alleged haunted castle uh, in Czechia, or in like, the former Czech Republic. And is it former Czech Republic? Czechoslovakia. Um, but it's uh, Huska Castle. And this is a medieval castle that's got some really disturbing folklore attached to it. Uh, but most importantly, apparently, it's been designed as not some type of impenetrable fortress to protect the people that are inside. It was actually, everything was pointed inside to stop something from coming out of the ground. Like something occult, something demonic, if you will. So I'm going to go into some of those stories later on in the show. Because that's where you'd build your ancient castle. Well, this castle is built in the middle of nowhere. (laughs) It's not connected to any types. Even in the ancient past, it wasn't connected to any type of uh, thoroughfare. It wasn't connected to trade routes. It's like- Think of the cost, though, to build a castle. That's, well, that's way more than you'd think of a massive mansion today. Oh, a castle be. back yeah. then would yep. be, you know, a lord with his his army and all his land and his yep. huge income puts together, a, you know, borrows some money from the Jews and puts together some huge castle. Well, when a, um, you know, a horrific monster is climbing out of those things, uh, you would put that money into it to stop it from- But that's what people. I'm saying. Like, why would you put invest all that money into a, a monster zone? Exactly. Yeah, that's a, a very good question, which may be revealed. <laughs> like, no, you're just like, revealed. exactly. <laughs> you don't answer exactly. my question. You're no. just like, exactly. Because <laughs> I don't want to reveal it. And I probably won't. <laughs> well, let's look at the curious case of King Dog. I just want to read you some of this old thread. Again, it was posted by Revolution9 over at AboveTopSecret.com back in May of 2011. And if you're not familiar, AboveTopSecret.com, I mean, it used to be mainly UFO stuff, right? Yeah. Back in the day when we used to look at it, uh, UFOs and alien conspiracies and 9-11 conspiracies. Now, just like a lot of things, it's all politics. <laughs> like it's all. You know what? I'm so sick of politics. It's just polluted. Every- everything is a cesspool on both sides. Like It's just everything's now destroyed. All media is political. You open up anything, it's always political. Like Let's just get back to people being taken by greys and pushed into UFOs in the middle of the night. Well, That's where we should be. I don't know if this time portal stuff is political. We'll see. So, yeah, this poster, he posted his personal experience. It was actually from 2008 that this occurred. But the reason he posted it was asking for help in understanding what actually happened to him. He said, I swear that this is honest. This is a true factual account. Not a word of exaggeration. But I can't provide any links, he said, because you cannot look this up. And it's correct. He's correct. I... I tried to really dig in and find references to this, and I wasn't unsuccessful, but it is very difficult. He said, it all started when a friend of the family, a college lecturer who lived in a beautiful cottage here in Cornwall, it's in an old former tin mining valley by the Atlantic Ocean called uh, Jericho Valley. This family friend, he said, presented my mom and dad with a video of some old film he, he had obtained from a friend at university. He said, look, I I never saw the film, but I did get to hear about it from my folks who asked me about it because they knew I was very well read in aspects of pagan activities. What they told me about the film was this. He said it depicted, well, the film had a title. It was called King Dog. It was a home movie, so it was filmed on one of those early, you know. Eight millimeter. Yeah, one of those eight millimeter Film style cameras, yeah. Uh, actually, it must have been older than that. He said it was filmed between the 1950s, perhaps very early 1960s. In the film, it showed a middle-aged man and three ladies in flowing gowns, uh, heavily made up with what looked like Egyptian eye makeup. And they were leading a procession of a very large square black box. Now, he says it wasn't coffin-shaped, but it would be large enough to fit like a large animal in there. The film is set in Jericho Valley, which is uh, this you know beautiful area of Cornwall, which I had a few pictures up on the screen, you know, mm. just showing 
what it's like, what the landscape is like. It's ancient as well, isn't it? I mean, look at that image there. It looks like if you're going to see fairies, you're going to see fairies there. there. It, it, yeah. It's a... and. The whole area is surrounded by ancient mythos regarding King Arthur. This is allegedly where King Arthur was conceived. Uh, Merlin's cave is there. There's an entire history of mermaid sightings. And if you're interested in looking up UFOs in the UK, this is the place. Cornwall is the place. There's so many UFO sightings, weird triangles, you know, rumors of hidden bases and all sorts of fun stuff from this area. But this film was set in Jericho Valley, which is yeah, in Cornwall. And they lead this procession from a house down into a wooded area. It's about 100 metres away from the house. The box is placed into a large, deep hole facing north. It's in a, a grove of trees that are in a perfect circle. And uh, he said during the middle 1960s in this valley area, this Jericho Valley, that's it on the screen there, there was a lot of bohemians in the area. There's a lot of hippies camping out, a lot of gypsies. Is that because of the connection to the land? Like it's a sacred kind of location? I don't know. I think they just like to hang out there. Okay. and Pretty countryside. He said this group of people were in awe of the spot where this box was buried. And again, it was referred to as King Dog. He said the area of trees, as I mentioned above, still has a defined circle there. And it's actually surrounded by a man-made circle of paved stones. He says it's around five meters in diameter. Um, and they're very beautiful green stones. And he said they're quite mysterious. They almost look like they're made of glass or crystal. They don't look like anything you would normally see, you know, out on a forest path. They've clearly been placed there for a purpose. Are they almost like they're volcanic? He's he's not sure. He just says they're lustrous, shiny green stones. Anyway, he says now it's all overgrown, but you can just move a few branches. You can still see this circle. You can still see these green stones. The house uh, from which the box began its procession in this video was called for many years Beit Hamal Akim, which is Hebrew for the house of angels. Is the video actually out there still? Can no. See, you can't get to it anymore. No. I mean, the idea is this had some kind of a cult purpose. So this isn't just something you can watch on YouTube. Mm. Uh, this is... Like it has a very specific purpose and watching the video creates an effect as you're about to find out. You mean like the ring style? Yeah, kind of. He says, as I can understand, uh, the house was owned by a Jewish gentleman who later moved to America. He said, look, when my parents told me about this video and the reason they asked him about it is because he had done some reading about, you know, occultism and paganism and they thought maybe he could help them understand it. And he just shrugged it off. He was just like, okay, well, yeah, this just looks like some weirdo pagan ritual. I don't really know anything about it. And he just didn't pay it much thought. Anyway, he says a few months later, he noticed this very strange change within him, like a spiritual change. He said, the old ground of my life completely gave away. He said, I got myself very isolated. I was doing so much reading, thinking, and creating. He said, I couldn't work. I was so infatuated with this inner happening he said, I couldn't even go and claim my welfare money and my money was stopped and I stopped eating. He says, it was a kind of paralysis. With all my experience of the system and my knowledge of all that really happens, I just didn't want to belong in it anymore. He said, I was even willing to starve to get away from it. And he said, that's what was actually happening. He was wasting away. He said, I was under a doctor at the time. I was taking heavy sedatives. I got quickly addicted to those. I started overdosing on them on several occasions. He said, I went back to my doctor who refused to give me the medication. He said, basically, I was so strung out. I decided the only thing I could do to fix my situation, to get out of this spiritual malaise, was to take magic mushrooms. <laughs> like, what do That's you do? That's a way out. What do you do, Aaron? That's a way out of reality. When your life's a disaster and you're completely disconnected from what you need to be doing, you take magic mushrooms. So he said, I picked some very strong magic mushrooms. And he said, in the few days before this happened, he started to have these strange dreams, very vivid, almost encounters in this dream state with what looked like a little fat king. And he described it almost cartoon in appearance, like what you see on the screen there, uh, like what you would see on a deck of cards or a, mm. a playing card, for example. Mm. This little fat squat dwarf king kept on showing up in these very lucid dreams. Doing what? Well, 
it was like he had a direction. This king was like a a signpost and he had two directions to take. One direction would be carnal, an earthly trip. The other direction would be a spiritual journey. And he said in one of these altered states, in front of this weird king, this little dwarf king, he chose the spiritual journey. Now, he said he was in the garden of his cottage where he lived. He was very depressed about all the things he was thinking of. I mean, he said, I was thinking about, you know, Jesus being crucified and uh, all these martyrs and his disciples and also John Lennon and Bob Marley. Like, okay, kind of different things. In the sky, I saw a rider on a white horse appear in the sky. This is after he's taken the mushrooms. The white rider spoke to me saying, it's cool, just live the word. He says it was a flash for three seconds that this vision happened, and he felt like this was a huge spiritual experience. But all of this happened because of this video he watched. He's convinced that it was after being told about this video, all his his life just went out of control. Like it just completely derailed. And he said after he had this mushroom trip, he kept on being pulled back to this king dog circle the one that was in this old film from the 1960s that was showing this occult ritual. Clearly, it's a good thing that people just can't arbitrarily just watch this video and get drawn into it. Yeah, you would think so. He said it was like a druidic experience. Mm. And I started to research the myths and legends of ancient Britain. Also Wales and Ireland, he said. It was almost like living out a Merlin incarnation with many comparisons to the Grail legend. He said it's hard to describe, but I was having visions of Merlin Visions of Joseph Joseph of Arimathea, visions of Arthur. And he said it was like I was going through a shamanic rite of passage, both Druid and Christian related. And the whole thing was a choice. Like he claims he could have gone and become a pagan. Like he was being drawn into this world. He was being attracted to this circle. He would have been introduced to individuals that perhaps would have initiated into something to do with that secret world. But he claims in the end, he chose Christianity. Uh, In these final days where he felt like he was being forced to have this inner choice, he claims he kept on seeing a dragon, serpent-like entity. What, hanging around in the background? Showing up in his dreams. He was having visions of it. He felt like he was being seduced by this thing. It was offering him great power and knowledge. Well, I'm wondering like Adam and Eve style. Yeah, it, it is the archetype of the serpent, the, the giver of knowledge from that old story. And of course, you know, many cultures around the world have the same thing. I was reading something the other day that had like a Papua New Guinean source and it was the same story. It was like, beware of the snake. Mm. It's the giver of knowledge, the giver of gifts, but it has a price. Um, so... He said, I once went up to the king dog circle and he said, I kind of, to make my decision, he said, I exercised it. He said, I planted a cross and a message by one of the trees there. And this message wrote, here lies the bones of King Arthur. Arthur was a Christian king and Merlin a priest of God. So he's really like, was he though? I, no, I don't think so. <laughs> like, Isn't this meant to be all pre-Christianity anyway? Mm. Um, no, he... He basically, well, maybe he was. I can't. What is the timing of Merlin? Because it's all in myth. It's not. It is in myth. Yeah. There's Uh, there's no real hard archaeological evidence. But what is the the supposed timing for it? Is it BC? That's a good question. I don't know. Um. Anyway, in the days after this act, in the days after this exorcism, well, he was introduced in the 12th century by a pseudo historical author by the name of Geoffrey of Mammoth. Yeah, but that's him but writing that's about it, the writing about story. It. Yeah, so how far back does the the story go? Hmm, that doesn't say. In the days after the exorcism, he said my life became very strange. I felt scared. I felt like I was in danger. He suddenly had the feeling that he had awakened something supernatural, but that he was also being viewed by conventional physical forces. And I say that because immediately after he did this exorcism at the circle, his house was broken into. Things ruffled around. Um, Nothing was taken, a small bit of money, like a few coins or something. And he said it really felt like the whole thing was to say to him, we know what you did and we're watching you. But 
By whom? Who would be watching him? The entities? No, he's starting to think that there's some group associated with this circle that did not like what he was doing. He said, later I found out from a friend who does gardening for the houses in Jericho Valley that still he would see people turn up at this king dog circle. People he didn't recognize. Wearing robes? Well, he he did say they kind of looked like Freemasons. And I did look up Freemasonry in the area. What does a Freemason look like? Just in robes, I guess. I did I did look up Freemasons in Cornwall, and there's just this old guy in his 90s who's like, we, we don't have any secrets. Believe us, we're telling the truth. <laughs> and he's just like in this purple robe with all these rings. Nothing to see here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and he said, after my mushroom journey, I was completely haunted by this dragon entity and King Dog. He said, I constantly had an urge to go up to the circle. And it's almost like these alien abduction stories where he's like, wakes up in the middle of the night, gets out of bed and he's like, I'm going to the circle. And he stops and he's like, wait, why am I going to the circle in the middle of the night? Does he describe that there's a a calling or anything, like a siren? Well, he just said like he had this feeling that he had to go out there and dig up the box that he saw in that old home video. He says, it was like, it was necessary for me to do it. I had, it was my mission to do it. He said, one, one night I was completely overwhelmed and a spiritual authority visited me. He had this spiritual vision. He says, I took it to be a benign entity and felt safe with responding to what it was asking of me. He says, it wasn't the serpent being, it wasn't the dragon. But he said, I knew the dragon entity was afraid of this being for some reason. He said, I was led in the spirit to take candles, a lighter, and a five-pound note of English currency and a copy of the New Testament and take it to the circle. He said, as I began my late-night walk there... So he's literally doing it. He's got all the stuff. He's going out there in the middle of the night. And he said, it was so confusing. It was like I had all these choices I could make as to what to do when I reached the circle from meeting the dragon. Like, he thought that perhaps if he started to think this way, that dragon-like entity would actually be there. That's a dangerous thing, though, to be calling in. Yeah, he would have some kind of um, initiation with a physical manifestation of it. And his thoughts in that moment leading up to this circle, it's kind of like the um, Schrodinger's cat. Like, it was all these potentialities of what could happen and whatever he chose in that moment would appear. He said... um, there was also a potentiality that he would be seduced by a beautiful woman. There'd be like a succubus or something there waiting for him in some lingerie. Uh, or the other extreme would be he would he would have to face like a powerful warrior spirit and he'd have to try and banish it somehow. <laughs> like all this, this crazy Obviously stuff. Obviously though, but- like very different outcomes, all equally dangerous and no planning has been put into I'll it. just be yawning and like, just give me the succubus. I'll just take care of that. Like- It'll be easy. Um, Anyway, he says, when I reached the woods, I knew that whatever King Dog was, there was something as powerful as an angel or a dark angel waiting in that circle for me. And that if I was going to go there, I wouldn't be able to resist it. I wouldn't be able to spiritually face up to it. He said, my decision was this. I decided not to go. And he actually shouted out loud. He said, Angel, I'm not going in there. You're too powerful. Go home. Go back to God. I want nothing to do with this. Like he took a stand. I'm done. He said, and Yet though, he's going there. Like he's <laughs> he's like, I don't want anything to do with this. I'm yeah. done. But he's going As there. As he's walking, like sleepwalking towards it. He said, I, I ended up placing the candles, the lighter, uh, the copy of the new covenant of Jesus Christ on the grass near to the opening of the woods. Uh, And he said he screwed up the five pound note and um, into a wick, he lit it with the candles and he walked away repeating the words he had spoken to the angel, almost in a trance, like he was in an altered state. Anyway, the next day he goes back to the circle in the daylight and he's like, I wanted to dig up the box. I, I really wanted to dig up whatever was buried there. He started to excavate. He started to remove the stones on the surface. He started to dig away at the dirt. And as he's doing this, all these voices and sayings and phrases start entering into his mind. You know, phrases like, um, let sleeping dogs lie. And it's clearly not his thought. It's something 
entering his head, something influencing him. Let sleeping dogs lie. Um, thoughts like my treasure is up in heaven. I don't need to dig into the dirt for it. And all these kind of, um, you know, like metaphors about curiosity killed the cat and stuff like yeah. that. Just warnings. And he said for many, he doesn't, so he stops. He doesn't dig. And he says, for many months afterwards, I kept on having strange dreams about the grail and this spot. And I can say that I, the friend of the family and my other friend who did the gardening in that area, all think there's some kind of relic buried there, some kind of powerful relic. And that the animal graveyard or dog grave rumors are just used as a cover for what is actually there. But is he suggesting the relic is the, the grail, the holy grail? No, he says grail in terms of like a grail quest. It's I like see. an alchemic um, spiritual undertaking. But there's something drawing him to this spot. He said, At, as the time moved on, I asserted my Christianity. I put these pagan ideas behind me. I've let sleeping dogs lie. But he said, sadly, the friend of the family who first came across this home video and showed it to my parents and showed it to me so many years ago committed suicide. And it is like the ring. He did this. And this reminds me of the Joe, Joe Fisher's books. Joe Fisher, the author who exposed the world of possessing spirits. Uh, he it was an investigative journalist and followed some of these fortune tellers for years and discovered that it was actually spirits trying to get on to people that listen to them. Uh, and he ended up throwing himself off the cliffs. Mm. But we always speculated that he was pushed because everyone said he wasn't suicidal. It was the same thing with this family friend. He he threw himself off the cliffs into the ocean down at Cornwall there because it's right on the coast. There's cliffs there. He said he was a really close friend to me. He'd been uh, depressed for a good long time. He will be missed. So he said, look, this is a very brief account. There were other factors involved. This is very complex. I'm just giving you the bare bones story. But he said, I feel more lonely than I used to feel. I feel like I've lost something the day I said no to what I was being drawn into. He says, my life is more empty and predictable and all the former magic has gone. But he said, I know I made the right decision. So what follows is it just a general plea for understanding on that forum. Uh, one poster named Wolverine 6 UK responded about six months later and said, hey, uh, I've seen this video. Like most of the comments were, you know, how do we find the video and, you know, what is this? And, you know, you just made this up and... This other poster said, look, I've seen the video of that procession. I've seen that burial in that video. I remember it. He said, it's black and white. There's no sound. It's all these people dressed like they're in a cult or religious regalia. You have to wonder, though, in the first place, why would they film it? Or was it filmed by someone who was observing them? Is that you know, how it got out? Well, it's like these kind of things. Filming it is part of the ritual. Like filming it is creating some kind of in their mind, some kind of spell or it's mm. having some kind of effect. Then the video itself, the film itself has some kind of occult power. I imagine that's what they believe. But these randoms on the internet just happen to also see it? Well, this is a person from Cornwall. He's a local to the area. And he says, I've got access to the video and there's a documentary about it. So apparently a local woman started looking into this um, and tried to interview some of the people involved. And the original poster said that he spoke to her and she was warned away from doing any more with it. Like she was told, you know, stop showing the film, stop showing your documentary, you're done. And she, that kind of all went away. There's no, you search for it today. There's nothing about it. You can't find any information at all. Uh, he says, it does make you wonder, this is the other poster, why the burial site after all these years has these hidden security measures uh, because it was said that if you went out there to have a look at this place, you it's would trial quickly camps or something. No, you, well, maybe you would quickly be questioned by by people who owned the house nearby. They'll be like, "Who are you?" It's not their property, but they'll be like, "Who are you? What are you doing here? What are you interested in?" Almost as if the people in that house, it was their job to look like over this site for it. Yeah, like they were responsible for it, or they're just like, "Who's people this know, weirdo?" Yeah, yeah, like yeah. who's this weirdo in the neighborhood? And is it relatively remote? It's like I'll it show you some images. I actually found some images. He said, I have more information which I would like to share, but uh, only to the original poster, as there's very rich people involved with this. Uh, the person who talk, talked about in the video is missing. Nobody was ever found. I'm reluctant to say much on this forum. 
Uh, and they said, look, I would also point out that the original film doesn't say it's the burial of a dog. It says Genga, king of dogs, inscribed on the coffin. And who's Genga? Well, I'm like, okay, well, this is my lead. What is Genga? So I start searching for terms associated with Genga. And I ended up, this is the first thing I found, The Romance of the Rothschilds by Ignatius Bala, like this old book on the Rothschild family. So the moment you bring the Rothschilds in, it becomes a little <laughs> bit conspiratorial. It's a little bit weird. Like you search for Genga with that spelling, which is G-E-N-G-H-A, and it tries to correct it to be Genghis Khan. But beyond that, there's basically nothing. nothing. The only other reference I found was this old Italian, like powerful Italian bloodline with like a crest of a griffin with muscles. And one of their family members was a pope at some stage. But that's about it. Like, it's probably not connected in any way. It's impossible to Google it. So the Genga King of Dogs was kind of a dead end. The last post on this was February 2024, this year. So the post is still active. Someone said, hey, I, I know this is a super old thread, but I'm convinced my grandfather was present during the filming of this. He said, if anyone- As in participating? Yeah. If anyone can share the footage, I would love to see it as we have few memories of him. And I'd like to see if it was truly him in this old video. My family has spoken to me before about the graveyard for the dog king. And this is the only thing I can find online about it. And that's the last post. Dead end. This old wacky story. Like, take your meds. So that simple solution <laughs> to being drawn out to some occult circle in Cornwall is uh, don't go there. But I seem to recall before... Um, ATS kind of went you know, into that political side of things. I remember that a lot of those threads were like, it's like someone mm. would pop up with what appeared to be an incredible story, but then it never really had any substance. It never really went anywhere. And that was really common because it was like, it was so, a lot of the stuff was just, if it is real, was so obscure and hidden that yeah, there you was would, no follow up. You would find interesting stuff on there occasionally. Um, but when I was searching, I found this, this website called Dark Tourism England. It's an old Wix blog. It's basically dead. Like, there's no activity on it since 2019. Is this an archived version? No, it's still live. Like it's still being hosted, but it's. I think it's just one of those free Wix accounts. And there's only two articles on there. Is it anonymous? Like yeah, the this, they don't give their name, but it's someone who's doing investigations on some of the strange stuff in Cornwall. And he had come across this post from Above Top Secret from 2011. And he wrote, uh, this was actually mentioned to me by a childhood friend of my father's. And by far, he said, this was the hardest to research of all the local spots. And he basically refers to the post that I just read you, that this is some burial ground of a sacred dog. There were rumors of this home movie from the 1960s, that there was some occult activity or some secret society associated with it. And he, this guy that that runs this website said, look, my partner and I, we decided to search for it. And that's what they do on the site. They go to these obscure places and try and find evidence of the story. And he says, it was just like aimless. It was all this aimless walking around. Like they couldn't find anything. They were just walking through the wilderness off the beaten track. He said, I came across a local who was a caretaker of a graveyard near the area. And this local was like, I have no idea what you're talking about. I've never seen anything like that. Uh, he said people commenting on the forum mentioned that if you go there, there's a warning on a rock by the entrance and people in the local house will approach you to find out your intentions. But he's like, that forum post is 10 years old. We didn't see anything like that. So What's like, the warning on the rock? Is that that image you showed before? Which I didn't see any inscription. That wasn't on the, I didn't put that on the screen. Oh, I see. I think, but, but, um, What's the warning? Just to stay out. Don't go there. So that was his first investigation. He couldn't find anything. But if you scroll down on the site, You'll see that he went back there on the 17th of August in 2019. Oh, so here's the rock. Yeah, he said, after a few days of wet weather, my partner and I, we headed back to Jericho Valley. Half an hour or so later, we finally came across what we'd been searching for, although there was something really odd we had spotted when walking a particular way down into the valley. He said, while walking down a narrow path to the bottom of the valley, he said that we, we came across these unmarked headstones that looked deliberate, like they'd been there for a very long time because there was no moss growing behind them. Um, and they were just leaning on this wall as a marker of sorts. And do I have do I have an image? Because oh, I wanted to show you this. I'll put this in the show notes as well. So that's what he saw, this this rock. 
And he's like, okay, that's weird. And he and his girlfriend, they keep looking. And eventually they find the gate to this graveyard where, where these stones are. And it's unremarkable. Like there's no signs saying what it is or anything. There's overgrown steps leading up to it. And he's like, I'm not even sure that this is what we're looking for. But then he said his girlfriend got really excited. And she, she says, this is it. We've found it. Because he looks around and it's the perfect circle of trees. Ah, oh, They're okay. in that grove that the original poster described. And you can't really make it out in the image. It's just, it just imagine like an overgrown forest if you're listening to the audio. It's just, but that is apparently a bunch of trees going around in a circle. He said, looking ahead, we could make out where the weeds had grown oddly and it was forming a dome. And there was clearly a circle where nothing would grow. And um, he said, as I started to look in the underbrush, he said, I saw something strange. There were these weird green stones. And that's it on the screen there. And it's totally overgrown. Like he had to push all the undergrowth aside and he starts seeing these shiny green stones and he looks closer. He's like, they're bath tiles. <laughs> yeah, because I'm thinking it doesn't look like it's stone. It looks like it's something else. But yeah, bath tiles make sense. Yeah. So you can understand why the original poster would be like, yeah, they were kind of weird. Like they were shiny. I'm not sure what they were. But when he uncovered them, this second guy that went out there, it's like, yeah, they're, they're weird green bath tiles that are so organized in a circle. Someone tiled a circle in the middle of nowhere? Yeah. He said it was so overgrown, but we were fascinated. There were these green tiles. They looked like slates, but they were so vibrant. He said even after such a long time, they looked almost silver, shimmering in the light. Anyway, he said, we're considering coming back with the right tools when the weather is better and, um, you know, properly digging into there without disturbing the tiles. He said, the graveyard interests me greatly and I would love to see it in its former glory. But now that we know where it is and I have the coordinates, it'll be easy to go back. Updates to follow. And that is the last thing that guy ever posted. <laughs> and is he dead? The website was dead after that. There's no more posts after that. There's no updates. There is nothing. Which is a little bit conspicuous because he's like, yeah, I can go back any time. I've got the coordinates. And the whole top of the article is like, this is the most interesting thing I've ever looked at. There's social media links down the bottom there. Did you click on any of those? Oh, they're all dead too. There's nothing. Like, it's all gone. It is. Well, look. I mean, people do, you know, come across strange things and they, you know, have the intention of going and digging further, but for whatever reason, life gets in the way and they never go back. But is there an implication here that he uncovered something he shouldn't have and has now disappeared? Well, you could infer that. I don't think that's out of the question. Like he looked into something that he wasn't supposed to and he, maybe it's benign. Like someone just said, you know, stay off my property or if sure. you come back, we're going to call the police. And he's just like, it's not worth the trouble. Maybe there's more to it. Uh, there were a couple of comments, though. One commenter named Kez Limited co commented in February saying, look, I'm the guy who had access to the video you spoke of. This must have been the other poster that was on Above Top Secret. Mm. He said, look, my nephew knew the story I had told him years ago. Uh, the dog grave on the video was titled Genga, King of Dogs. This is the second person saying Genga, King of Dogs. He said the story got quite dark, though, and uh, I was instrumental in what happened during the 2000s. If you want to know more, let me know, but please, only by personal message, as this is a delicate situation and I'm a little concerned about making this too public. Okay, that's just strange though. Like, you're concerned about making it too public, but you're publicizing it and you're saying it's delicate, but like, you're putting yourself clearly at risk, but at the same time, leaving it out. In yeah, the it's like they, they want to talk about it, but they don't want it all out there for people like me to find and talk about on a podcast. Well, it's going to happen. <laughs> Another commenter said, hey, I'd like to get in touch too, please. Uh, my family may have been involved with this story and could potentially be in this film. I'd like to see if it's possible, uh, but please get in touch. So does and the then, film show actual faces of people or are they all robes? I have no idea what the film shows. Like you can't see it. It's uh, no de depictions of it. It's funny though, when I looked it up, like when I did a, a, an original search for it, the first result I was using Brave Search was King Dog Movie. Because I searched like King Dog Film, King Dog Movie, and it came up with King Dog Movie. But it, it said there's no film of that title, but there is a ti movie titled Arthur the King, which features a dog named Arthur starring Mark Wahlberg. It came out last month 
March, oh. March 2024. That's an odd coincidence. And I'm like, that's that's a weird synchronicity. Like I search for the King of Dog movie and it's a it's called Arthur the King. King Arthur. Surely that's just a coincidence. Yeah, maybe. Coincidence. Or is it the power of is it the power of Genga reaching out through the internet? So I thought, okay, I gotta keep looking. Obviously, Cornwall is full of weirdos. <laughs> it's a weird spot. You got weird occult circles. Well, we've we've heard people tell us privately about weird druid activities in that region of the world. Mm. You know, we've been approached by people who have described some pretty strange stuff there. Well, one of the first things that came up was an article from Codastory.com. Castles, crystals, and conspiracies enter the spiritual home of British QAnon. Trust the plan, Aaron. Cornwall was the headquarters of British QAnon. And I started... Oh, my. There's all these hit pieces surrounding this place called Camelot Castle, which was built in the late 1800s. I mean, it doesn't really look like a real castle, but it's this beautiful area. Obviously, it's showing video on the screen here. You know, absolutely incredibly beautiful area. But there's this castle you can go to. There's... uh, It's overlooking this ancient, you know, rock glyph, and it's overlooking the ruins of a real castle. And you can go and stay there. And the guy that owns it is, uh, did I have a better story? Who's John Mappin? His name's really familiar. John Mappin. Oh, Con- conspiracy theorist. <laughs> conspiracy theorist Hotelier offers discount for anti-vaxxers. So if you're, an, you know, this oh. is just like a media hit piece. But if you're a Q fan, if you're a Q fan, you get a discount, like staying in his hotel. If you're an anti-vaxxer, you get a Look, discount it's staying not in below his hotel. Me <laughs> to get a discount at a hotel, so yeah, sure, yeah, cute or great, dude. If it's an expensive castle, I'll be a communist for three nights. <laughs> if I can stay at your fancy hotel, like give me a discount. Um, and there he is there, and there's all the, again, there's all just these ridiculous hit pieces, and he is that a real flag? He's obviously just put that up to troll. He people. raised a Q flag on top of the castle. Surely he's two more people. weeks. Aaron, trust the plan. Rumors are that the sealed uh, military indictments are held in the castle. Oh. <laughs> Just, you know, it's just silly. These are almost the people that are as crazy that believe that uh, XRP validators are going to be placed on Starlink satellites and that it's <laughs> going to be the new financial Nasara system. Yeah, look, it's just silly. And that's the kind of stuff that was coming up immediately when searching Cornwall. But there were other things as well. And I started to realize, you know, the occult angle is is deep and rich with this part of Britain. Uh, one of the things that became clear with this is that our old friend Alistair Crowley Oh, that's why. He had a house that's there. That's why it's familiar. Yeah, Alistair Crowley owned a, uh, well, so allegedly owned a little, um, not village, a little hut. <laughs> what is, is it? Virginia Woolf was in this same hut. Is that what it's saying? Yeah. Oh, no, it's saying tales that involve Alistair Crowley, the Dalai Lama and Virginia Woolf. But there's just it- a lot of abandoned houses in Cornwall. And I'll I'll get to that in a moment and expand out the idea that the reason something like this occult circle and this Genga king of dog relic artifact could be there is because there's something about the place. There's something about the landscape. There's something magical about this area. Well, I, I think Virginia Woolf went crazy in the end. So I'm like, I wonder if there's some type of influence here that's causing people to go well, off the deep end. Speaking of influence, I found um, this one as well. This is from the local press, uh, Lisa Letcher writing that Candace Collins has had to lock the bone necklace away with holy water, but still says it feels strange and is calling out to her. She's referring to Alistair Crowley's pendant that made her want to worship the devil. And it's this funny little story in the local press just from last month of this woman. There it is there on the screen. She went to an auction. And she spent a bunch of money to buy Alistair Crowley's old pendant. Oh, you don't want anything that he's been remotely associated with. And it, the the article's kind of funny. That's her um, partner. That's there. her. That's not. <laughs> that's not. That's her partner. After touching something from Crowley straight away, it's like you're done. It's a man with a beard and a heavy metal T-shirt for our audio listeners. But she's basically trying to start a uh, paranormal artifact museum, and she thinks, okay. Crowley's artifact, it will be perfect for the museum. We all know how that turns out for people. She can't, And her partner's interviewed in the article, and he said when she held it and she took it out of the box for the first time, she, she, yeah, <laughs> it's not the wind. She, she started licking it and kissing it. She's like... Mm-hmm. You know that's been in someone's asshole. <laughs> yeah, probably. Yeah. And she she started talking about blood, and and I just look at them and go, yeah, that's probably that's probably what they talk about all the time anyway. 
Well, yeah, potentially. Yeah. But you know, this is the thing, these artifacts, you know, like you just, you don't want to, I, I get the fascination, especially from like a psychometry kind of point of view and historical point of view, but something that's specifically been ha- like focused upon mm. to put that energy into it, it's going to bring nothing but disaster into your life. And clearly from just reading the headline and the first couple of lines of that paragraph, is that what happened to her? Well, he had to take it away from her. He had to put his foot down and say, no, you're not having this. It's going under lock and key. And he said for two or three days, she was like shaking. She was having withdrawals. She was going crazy. And he he said, yeah, we're into some occult stuff, but I've never seen her behave like that. And they're convinced it's because of this artifact. Now, on the other hand, if you're starting a paranormal artifact museum, that is the you perfect wanna, story yeah. mm-hmm. that you want in the press to advertise your upcoming launch of your museum. Yeah. So, yeah, obviously take it with a grain of salt. But, you know, I kept on searching for interesting connections with Cornwall and I came across this one from Peter Grego, Cornwall Strangest Tales, Extraordinary But True Stories. And this is where you start to understand that the weirdness with this area in Britain uh, has a long, rich history. You know, you can go back to as early as 1645, which is the story I'll tell you. This is the story of Anne Jeffries, a local from the area. She was 19 years old. And we have records of this. This is all in the old documents. She was working for the Pitt family in St. Teeth. And she was knitting in one of her employer's gardens on the property. And she was uh, startled. The the hedge next next to her started to rustle. And she looks over and there's six weird little beings standing outside the hedge. They're just suddenly in front of her. She said they had bright, shining eyes and they're all dressed in green. Anne claimed that the leader of the group of fairies landed on her lap, then clambered clambered up her breasts and started kissing her neck. This was a tension that she enjoyed so much that the other fairies soon joined in. So I'm like, okay, well, this is the first book in this story. I'm just getting a fairy orgy (laughs) in the opening pages. One of the fairies ran his hands over Anne's eyes and she felt as though she'd been pricked by a pin and she's immersed in darkness. Now, she claims that when she opens her eyes, she's like speeding through the air, like some kind of sci-fi film. She opens her eyes and she's in this beautiful forested land. Everything's transformed around her. It's ornamented with these large temples that are gilded in gold and silver. It's got a very spirited away feeling to it. Yeah, absolutely. And... There's hundreds of normal-sized, like, humans there as well. Normal-sized people that are walking about. Are they confused or are they just... No, they're, like, playing badminton and having picnics. Okay. <laughs> like, just enjoying the beautiful day. And they're all dressed, like, elaborately. Like, it's uh, Alice in Wonderland, some kind of fairy tale, which it obviously is. And she looks down and she's transformed as well. She's wearing some kind of elaborate dress and it's all very... um it's all very, what's the word, fancy and articulate. And this is where the story is bizarre because it all it says is she suddenly understood she had no inhibitions and she then proceeded to make love with a handsome resident of this other world. <laughs> like immediately she, she lands there and she's like, oh, well. You're just suddenly promiscuous? <laughs> and what do the fairies do? The fairies kick her out. Because she's a whore. Normally it's the fairies that are the whores. Like, come on, like every time, it's fairies. They're the creepy ones. It said the fairy who blinded her had no choice but to do so again and she was rapidly whisked away back to reality. (laughs) So this is possibly the first fairy, like, spirited away Kamikakushi story we've ever covered where they got booted out of fairyland for being a whore, (laughs) like, within the first 10 minutes of being there. (laughs) <laughs> like she was just Did they give her an explanation or they just kick her out? No, they kicked her out. Um, and she claims when she came back, she had clairvoyance, like she had mystical powers. Uh, and she had a reputation, like the local authorities visited the her. Whore? Well, no, the authorities visited her because this story started to spread and the authorities said, you know, you must say no to the devil's temptations. And she says it was 16 something, 1645 right? yeah. or Very something. Very dangerous times to be accused of witchcraft. And sh- they basically, the ultimatum was you have to say that this wasn't true or you have to openly deny it. And she's like, no, it actually happened. I stick by my, you know, my convictions that this actually happened. Well, we're really sorry, but we have to set fire to you now. It wasn't that bad. She got three months in prison. 
Um, but she cl- and she went on a hunger strike as soon as she was in prison, and they couldn't figure out how she was surviving. According to the story, she went three months without any food. When she got out, she said the fairies were bringing her sustenance every night. Um, and she was adamant till her death that her experiences were real, that she actually went to another place. She had intercourse with another being, and she refused to promote her tale uh, even for 500 pounds, she said. like, Not that she was offered that, but that was the saying. She said, I wouldn't spread the story for 500 pounds. I'm not interested in talking to it, but I... You know, I stick by it. It happened. And she went to her deathbed claiming that this happened. And the author of this book says, isn't this strange that this mirrors the whole alien abduction motif? Yeah, I was thinking that because the the sexual elements, the other humans hanging around, like it sounds like a more modern style report, maybe from the 70s, 80s of like the my labs of people saying that they're abducted and then they find themselves you know, whist somewhere and there's other humans, but that's why I asked if they were confused because in many yeah. of those reports, it's just other human beings that have been abducted at around the same time and they've got no idea where they are. And how many claimed alien abductees come back and they have their clairvoyance unlocked, they have uh, well, how, s- psychic sensitivities. Exactly. And how many come back though and end up with poltergeist encounters in their homes, that kind of stuff. Yeah. So interesting, but no closer to understanding the Genga King of Dogs story. Yeah, what so does it have to do with that? We have to keep looking because I'm looking for some kind of link. So I thought, well, you know, that means there's witchcraft and there's fairies in the area. So I looked at this other book from Kelvin Jones called Witchcraft in Cornwall. He's written a couple of books on the history of the the secret witches in the area. Uh, what's this effigy on the front cover? It's like it looks like a weird yeah, it's like a, a doll thing. It's like a voodoo doll. Mm. But Jones writes about one of the most famous pellers in the region. And a Pella was... Not a witch per se, but like a wise woman who would deal with witches for you. Like if you thought you were cursed or someone had put some black magic on you, you would go to a Pella and the Pella had the ability to dissolve the curse. Right. So it was kind of a handy service back back in the day. Uh, and her reputation was quite good. According to Jones, he said uh, she was entirely benevolent. Her name was Tasman Blight. Tammy Blee was her nickname. She would heal and cure literally hundreds of people, according to the records, uh, from all across Cornwall. Uh, She was born in Redruth in 1798, and yeah, she claimed to be a direct descendant of other true blood pellets. It was like a thing that was passed down among the bloodline. Um, We don't know much about her life, but we do know that she married uh, James Thomas, aka Jemmy, in 1835. She was 38 years old, And, and Jones argues that it started to get very dangerous to be a Pella, to be a wise woman, to be involved with any kind of... Well, because that's considered a witchcraft in itself. Yeah, witchcraft. So they argue, you know, she would have married him. You know, maybe she loved the guy, but it would have been great protection to have a to have a husband back then. Um, but pretty quickly we learned that marrying Jemmy probably wasn't the best career move. Why? Because Jemmy was also one of these um, pellets. Like he had the ability to deal with curses and deal with afflictions and he had magic powers and psychic abilities. He could deal with them. Uh, He had a different type of clientele. He mainly uh, helped out young boys and young men Uh, with their uh, afflictions. mm -hmm. And uh, I asked the AI to do an image of him. Yes. I can help you with your problem, young man. And the way he would help them uh, Uh, with their afflictions was secret bum sex. (laughs) The thing is, after all these years and knowing Crowley's work, (laughs) I'm not surprised. I like it how you're just like dead man. Uh, Yep. Makes total sense. I'm not surprised. Uh, And it's It's funny because you go, there's all these newspaper reports about the guy in, you know, the 1800s where one of them, this was in the the West Britain, they said, during the week ending Sunday last, a wise man had been engaged in about half a dozen witchcraft cases, one a young tradesman and another a sea captain. He declared both of them spellbound, and the only way to solve the issue was to sleep with him. <laughs> it's just like goes through. So what I said before about <laughs> Crowley's bone? <laughs> yeah. It's probably right. All these spells, like people are under the sp- these occult spells. And he convinces them that that he has, like, these men have to sleep with him and it'll basically cure whatever affliction they had. And these men do it. 
And what's funny is you would think, okay, obviously they're gay, he's gay, and it's like some kind of cover so that they can, you know, do their gay activities. But so later, craft download. No, but later you realize that some of them just got hoodwinked. <laughs> And they actually thought that he would cure them by having gay sex with them. Like, there's another article later, um, and it's a complainant from a Mrs. Painter who made the complainant through her husband, a William Painter, um, because she had a spell on her. Like, she had some kind of affliction. So this guy turns up at their house. Yeah. He's like, yeah, it's well, clearly you've got this dark magic spell that's over you. And she's like, oh, how do, great Pella, how do I, Jemmy, how do I solve this? And he's like, well, your your husband has to suck me off. That's basically what he said. Oh, no, not you. Yeah, the husband Where has to husband? do it. And that is actually in the, that's in the criminal complaint. It's <laughs> in the newspaper report from the Don't early, laugh, it's dreadful. the early 1800s. And she's going before the magistrates going, he, he wanted my husband to commit a disgraceful offense. And he ended up sleeping with all these dupes. Uh, there was young men from Copper House, young men from Hale, one of them a mason, the other one was a miner. Uh, Jemmy said himself that uh, he had cured a young man from St. Earth, and he was going on Saturday again to the man's property to take care of a spell of his father, a oh, tin smelter. A follow-up session. No, it wasn't with him. It was with his dad. <laughs> he was going back to cure his dad. <laughs> And in the newspaper report, it says, one of the young men is thoroughly ashamed of himself to think that he has been duped by this scoundrel. So you can imagine, like, the buyer's remorse. (laughs) And you got to pay for it, too. Like, you got to pay to get cured by this guy. And, uh, yeah, that's so that not not any closer to understanding the Genga. I, I think we're actually further away than we expected. Dog King. I thought I got to look somewhere else. So I went into Mark Anthony Wyatt's A Haunted Legacy, The Spirit of Cornwall. Okay, maybe this will help us understand what's going on. So in the early summer of 1977, he talks about this um, personal experience he had. He was 17 years old and he was with his buddies and they were uh, in the small fishing village of St. Ives, which is where that dog circle supposedly yep. is. That's near Jericho Valley. Oh, so no one knows publicly where this place is. Like, it's just, what, conjecture? Well, that guy online found it, but, yeah, it's, there's no address posted okay. or anything. Um, anyway, he was up there, I think, with two other buddies, and they were just messing around, you listening to music. They were sitting on the huge grey lumps of granite out there. Because, again, Cornwall has granite. all these stone circles everywhere, like huge men here's and... But what's granite associated with? It's also associated with, you know, paranormal phenomena because of the quartz content in it. Yeah, and he says all up there on the moors, it's very misty. Um, you know, there's mist everywhere. Uh, they call it the... They have a name for it. They have it... It's called the... I don't know, it'll come up. They call it the hag or something. They keep referring to the hag, but they're just referring to the mist. mist. Yeah. Anyway, they're just listening to their music and they say, then we saw it, a black hound. And he says... It wasn't really like a pet dog. It was this giant hound emerged out of the mist. And he said, what it made what made it stand out? The eyes were like two fiery lumps of coal. So it's a traditional, you know, uh, black dog yeah. that you hear in folklore. He said it had no collar and its motion was odd. The way it was moving, he said it was almost like it was floating on the ground versus, you know, moving with its legs. Yes. Gliding, he said. And we all just stood there, watched, totally mesmerized. This giant hound just stopped gently panting, panting, stared at them, and then trotted off back into the mist. The swirling hags, they call them. And they just stood there looking at each other, and they half expected to the, the owner to come out of the mist or for them to hear the owner calling out for Fido or something. But obviously that never happened, and they just tried to tell themselves that it was someone's pet. But he's like... here in the distance, Fenton! Yeah. Fenton! <laughs> That's an old one. But he says, thinking back on it, it was totally supernatural. The whole thing was supernatural. So that's how it is, yeah. That's how this guy got into these some of these weird stories from where he grew up. Well, it, it sounds like that's almost a uh, initiation that's described. You know, like an occult initiation, encountering something like that. His understanding was that yeah, it's a spirit on of the landscape, and that's often speculated as to what these large hounds are if there's something supernatural to them. But he feels like it was pissed off at their music. 
Because they were playing, you know, like 1970s rock and roll. Very um, disruptive, very um, kind of angry music. Well, contrasting to the landscape. Yeah, the energy of it is very low and negative. And he says it's almost like this thing came to just check him out. Like, what are you guys doing? What are you idiots doing? You have to also wonder, because there are people out there that believe that um, certain types of music can influence, from an occult perspective, your surroundings. Mm -hmm. So if you've got angry or dark or music that's like that, mm. like, is it actually acting as a, some type of summoning tool? Yeah, interesting. That's an idea too. And you're going to a location which has already got occult properties to it and then you use a certain music which has got occult properties and, mm. you know, that's the result. Well, Wyatt's done a great job of collecting the more modern accounts because you can spend all day going into fairy folk tales and old legends from Merlin and all that old oh, history. Oh, there's so much there. But he's picking out the contemporary stuff. So there's very modern encounters that he's reporting on. So one of them was from July of 1996. There was two young male campers, again, just young guys. They're out on the moors. Uh, you know, they've got, got something to drink. They've got their music. They've got their tent. And they were camping out on Bodmin Moor. Yep. And they were right near one of these ancient stone circles called the Cheese Ring. Yeah, Jonathan Downs has actually done a lot of work on the Bodmin Moor, if I recall correctly. Yeah, right. Yeah, a lot of weird stuff going on. And it was near... There's an exposed piece of granite, and it's traditionally called the Devil's Ring. Well, that's the stone circle, the Devil's Ring. You might might look it up. Anyway, uh, one of the male campers, James, he ended up writing this experience into Saucer Review, so that's how we know about it. But they had just gone off to sleep, and uh, it's in the early hours of the morning, like one or two in the morning, and they just hear this horrendous, absolutely horrendous scream, like the most ungodly shriek you have ever heard this hideous scream and it's accompanied by a blinding bluish white light Mm. like they can't even through the tent they can barely open their eyes and they look out they try and look outside the tent but it's just so intense all they can see is white and they hear this shrieking like someone's being murdered a woman's being slaughtered or something when you're saying white you mean like in a white mist that they can't see through. It's just so bright. Like, right. they're just blinded right. by the brightness of this light. And it's far too bright for them to look at it. So what they do, they're so terrified, they just basically, these two grown men, they just huddle together with their little torch and they're just basically lying there all night. Like, just make this go away. It lasted that Eventually, long. Eventually, the screaming, no, not all night. It, the screaming stops after a few minutes. And as soon as the screaming stops, whoosh, the light's gone. It's yeah. darkness. Now, they just wait till daylight. They're too scared to leave the tent. But, the first guy, James, when he left the tent, he screams when he leaves because he sees right next to them is the completely mutilated corpse of a sheep. And he said- it You mean was, like cattle mutilation style? Yeah, it was bizarre. The front legs were completely missing. The spine was contorted. Most of the flesh had been removed and there's no blood at all. There's no like mm. teeth marks. There's no scrapes. There's no- poor marks there's no blood it's just this carcass right there sitting next to their tent no tracks it's just like no tracks yeah nothing yeah been dumped now a year earlier in that same area in bodman moor there was a man driving about 10 20 p.m and he claims he saw weird lights ahead of him and when it came into view it was a black triangle so you know just to throw that in there there are these reports associated with that area with these craft So, again, this is just underlying the strangeness of the area. You're talking about all sorts of activity, but perhaps something a little bit closer to our original story of the circle and the dog king is the story of Cecil Morgan. This is a true story. He'd been walking out on the North Cornish cliffs with his little cocker spaniel, Susie. And uh, this is in the 1920s, we know this report from. And according to him, he had just stopped and he was admiring the view. And he had slowly become aware that the Oz effect had kicked in. All the natural sounds of the birds and the waves and... It's like a vacuum. Everything else had just stopped and it's incredibly quiet. And he looks around and the seabirds have gone because there's always seabirds on those cliffs. And the sheep, which are usually just milling about, you know, munching on the grass, spread out. They've all gathered together in this circle behind him like they're hurting. They're afraid of something. And he starts to hear this sound. He starts to hear this interesting sound. I'll see if I can play like um, some kind of example for you. Do I have it? No, I won't play it. Just imagine. 
he starts to hear this call, like a siren, almost a siren call. The way he describes it is interesting. He said it was it was this eerie serenity, this dreamlike, timeless sound, and it seemed like it was emanating from the caves below him. He's, he later said it felt as if the sounds were emerging from some other plane of existence. At first, he said it, it wasn't sinister at all, like it sounded heavenly, but he became entranced by this music, and immediately he's like, I need to climb down to those caves. Like, I need to get down and listen to that. That is amazing. So he knew something was luring him down there. Like, he had this understanding that something's trying to get me down there, but he just felt powerless to resist it. And the sounds, he said, were like undulating sighs from singing, some kind of melancholic invitation, ethereal sounds that were way beyond normal comprehension, way beyond normal capabilities. Now, Cecil started to climb down. And these are, I wish I had an image to show you of the cliffs there, but these are bloody steep cliffs, like very dangerous cliffs right on the seaside. He starts clambering down to try and get to one of these caves. And he he believes that his dog saved him because he's about halfway down and he just looks up and he sees his little spaniel just going, like looking down at him, not at him, but past him. Like and, he can see something. And growling, yeah. And he's halfway down and he's like, I, I need to go to these caves. So he actually says to his dog, come on, Susie, come on, be a good girl. Come down with me. And this dog's having none of it. This dog somehow knows better. Meanwhile, the weird sounds from the cave, they're getting more urgent. They're getting louder. And Cecil had been torn. Like, should he keep going down or should he climb back up the cliffs to his beloved spaniel? Luckily, that he says the love and concern for his dog caused him to go back up. And he ended up going back up and um, grabbing his dog. But does he see anything or does, like, why does he, does he just somehow instinctually know that well, there was it, something dark down there? It was only in hindsight when he had picked up the dog and moved away from the area that he kind of snapped away from, from the influence. Yeah, he snapped out of the spell and he thought, what the hell was I thinking? That was insane. Like, thank God for my dog. Well, I mean, he could have, it simply could have been that he was about to fall and somehow the dog knew as well. Well, he, he was convinced that the dog was looking at something below him that he couldn't see. Anyway, after a few weeks of dealing with this, he started to tell people about it. Like he confided in a few close friends and said, you know, I had this weird experience down there. And uh, this retired sea captain named Kroll uh, actually pulled him aside and said, you know, something like that happened to me years ago. He said, I'd almost forgotten about it until you told me your story. He said, I was 14 years old and I heard those same sounds. He said it sounded like a wordless choral, like women's voices continuously rising and falling and he was drawn to it as well but he doesn't give details on on what he did but he obviously didn't succumb to it he didn't follow it but it's interesting again this this author mark anthony wyatt he says this again is very similar to the whole alien abduction archetype of being lured out you know going somewhere at night and you don't really understand why you're doing it coming out into the backyard for some weird reason at three in the morning. Oh, the, the parallels are just, you know, they're, they're simply astonishing. Yeah, he says the victims are aware they're being pulled towards something. Mm, but, but don't know how to resist. Yeah, they feel powerless to break the spell. And of course, he talks about the Greek myths with the sirens and the mermaids. And this guy's name is Morgan, and Morgan is the old Celt name for mermaid. Mm. So it's pretty weird. And so, interesting. Still not closer to understanding the dog circle. Are we going to crack the code? Well, I went into this one from Kelvin Jones. Occult. Oh, I've read this. Cornwall. Have you read this Yes, one? I've read this. Yeah, he's got some interesting stories. One of his stories was told to him firsthand. It was uh, a friend and her daughter were going for a hike along that area, along the coast. And the friend, the woman said she was going down one path and her daughter took a slightly different path mm -hmm. and it just kept getting higher and higher and higher. And he said, eventually, because of the mist, this mist came in, the daughter realized, oh, I, I can't see my mother and started calling out to her. Wasn't the Oz factor in that as well? Was there a... She said she started to go down the hill, like kind of walk through the brambles to get down to the lower path. And the mist came in and she started to feel 
hands oh, around her neck. It. Do yeah. you remember that one? Mm-hmm. She started to feel hands around her neck and weird vi- whispers in her in her ears. She eventually broke out of it and met up with her mother on the bottom track, but she was like, we're never coming here again. I'm yeah. done. Let's move to London. Let's get out of here. Uh, and he spoke to her and he said, you know, the look on her face, she was obviously still terrified about it. But it's funny, I was going through this book, you know, looking for other stories. And again, they're very similar to things that we've heard over the years of the... F- there's tons of UFO stories, tons of witchcraft, tons of supernatural stuff. The triangles, though, the the TR3B style UFOs are rather like they're very modern. Like really, because UFOs, you've got sources. For the most of the part, it's always been sources, cigar shaped craft. Mm. Like the triangles are really like 90s. Like, oh yeah, very very new. And the fact that you've got these new sorts of sightings happening in this location, which has you know got a lot of ancient phenomena associated with it, is very strange. Yeah, it's like the activity around this area comes and goes it changes forms but it's it's it like modulates there's something stuff. about cornwall which is like a nexus for this stuff yeah. in the uk mm. and i got a little clue in this occult cornwall book from kelvin jones in the epilogue you see in this area along the north coast of cornwall actually no it's not it's the most southern tip it's the most southern tip of that area so it's the most southern tip of land on the mainland of Britain. It's called the Lizard. That's just what they call it. And it's like a tail kind of jutting out. Yeah, and Jones claims there's a shamanic cult that are dedicated to a dark serpent goddess that still operate in this area. And he Nothing said- Nothing would surprise me anymore. They believe that in the caves and dark places of the earth, this serpent manifests and they can commune with it. Hence why you would build a circle to get it to manifest. Well, Robin Ellis, another researcher, wrote about this cult. He said, the great secrecy with which the lizard Pella cult operates is understandable as they wish to carry on their projects without uh, outside interference. So could this be the cult in the video? He says, people can become the vehicle for a tremendously powerful earth force that enables them to heal and do magic. Recently in Cornwall, he said, there has been established a network of these groups. He said at a recent meeting of the network, I discovered X, a middle-aged man who had spent a lifetime following the old traditions. He said, X, this man revealed to me that his uh, ancestors came from Ewan Minor on the Lizard and that his grandmother was one of the last upholders of this ancient craft, this ancient cult. As a child, he recalled how he was initiated into the methods of this craft and that the mysteries and rituals of the craft were administered solely by women. He said the traditions had been orally transmitted and the structure of the coven was determined only by personal contact. So that was the clue I was looking for. He said the old folk religion has not died, it has simply gone underground. So there are still groups in this area that believe in the pagan gods, they follow things like a serpent goddess and they operate entirely in secret. They don't have crests, they don't have logos, they don't have websites, they don't have books about them. Everything is communicated and passed on orally, entirely in person yep. and entirely by word of mouth. Which keeps it very much hidden. From one keeper of the, the practice to the disciple. And these are the true secret societies that exist amongst us. They are truly secret. There's not a podcast about them. There's not a book about them. Oh, they don't come into popular culture. You know, they don't pop up in in magazines. Like they're just, you're totally right. There is just no knowledge. It's like zero knowledge. That is a true secret society. Yeah. Outsiders just don't know about them because it is secret. It is truly a cult. And that, although we don't have an answer, that could be the clue as to what's actually behind this strange mystical circle. What was going on in the 1950s and 60s with this video that was taken of them? In the opening post, he was having visions or dreams or experiences of there being some serpentine creature in the circle. The serpent was luring him got- in with promise of power and knowledge. And you have a uh, serpent worshipping cult. This essentially. serpent cult that's still operating in the area. So that could be the answer. That could be what Genga is. Maybe Genga's the name of the entity. Yeah, maybe. But uh, that's Cornwall. And the last thing I want to leave you with before we go into our plus extension, because I was talking about the time portals, right? Yeah. There's this artist 
His name is um, what is his name again? <laughs> Bob Osborne, and he's one of these really eccentric. Uh, he's like a Banksy kind of character, and his latest artwork was to take. It's called Cash is King, and he takes these banknotes from around the world, mostly England, and he defaces them, and it's like meant to be this revolutionary art. Does he put them back into circulation? <laughs> like, well, I mean, it's like he's drawing Pac-Man on them, so I doubt it. I mean, there, there is art. You can buy them for millions of dollars and put them in your home. Um, and this is his big thing. He does all this kind of subversive, esoteric art. But this guy has been living in this area for, like his family's been there for generations. And he's written a new book, which I'm trying to get hold of. It's only in paperback and it's been sold out everywhere. He's reissuing it now. Zenor. It's called Zenor Spirit of Place by Bob Osborne. And I've pre-ordered a copy. I, I want to look into it because this guy is really tapped into the hardcore esoteric stuff going on. And I just want to play a little video of him. This is from another podcast. It's called the, um, I can't remember its name now, but I'll tell you once it starts playing. <laughs> once it starts playing, I'll tell you. But this is the kind of character he is, the kind of stories he tells. Let's take a quick listen. I've, got, I've had a very weird, complicated family history. Um, my father was one of 18. Um, we're only gypsies, 17 boys, one girl. Um, wow. My father's mother was Nelly. She was a Romany. She spoke Romany. And um, we, we had um, uh, stables and then horses and carts. We were called totters. Um, we had a monkey called Wanker, and so they're very different. <laughs> a monkey called Wanker. <laughs> so the podcast is the Amish Inquisition, and yeah, he had a pet monkey called Wanker. Let's keep listening. Uh, Sorry, he had a monkey, monkey called Wanker. My uh, one of my uncles was um, Popeye, the sailor man. He was called, and he was he was in the navy. And of course, then in in the sixties, when I grew up, grew up in that part of London. Um, you could, there was no restrictions. We had horses and carts, we had vans. You could bring a monkey off a ship. So we had a monkey, a little um, and we had it on our flat. And uh, it was called Wanker because all it would do was, was run around the wall and, and, you know, perform that sexual act. So <laughs> well, this is a true story. We used to take it down the pub. My dad spent all his life in the pub. He was an alcoholic, and they all were, uh, well, probably not alcoholics in those days, but that was just the best place to be. And, um, we would dress it up, uh, put it a little blazer on it and give it a bottle of Mackerson and sit it in the corner. And my dad's family would be in gypsies. They were all incredible con men. So everyone would come in and say, can we buy the monkey a drink? So we say, well, well, he's got one at the moment, put, put it behind the bar. <laughs> so it was another way of, um, of getting free drink. We also had a parrot called fuck off. <laughs> so a bit of a character, you get the idea, right? Yeah. A character. So he's done all these interviews about not, you know, monkey stories, but the weird research he's been doing about Cornwall. And it is like schizo, off the wall. Off your meds. M like Montauk style conspiracies, time portals, just insane. Ra and he did this interview. Uh, and I'll link to this show in the show notes. This is another podcast I took a clip from. He, he, it's a four part, eight hour interview. <laughs> Just, of what him describing a, a Cornwall Montauk essentially. Well, this is him talking about the spirit of place, the the weird nexus of energy that attracts so many strange people to Cornwall. Let's take a listen to what he's got to say about this this weird energy. There's two very special special places that I've connected to this sense that you can actually time travel uh, because Senna is always. Isn't that Miles to Johnston's um, to other show? Worlds. So. The basis project. I think it's, is that Miles? And he is <laughs> unusual to say the least. <laughs> well, yes. I mean, yeah. Hold your judgment because it's not Miles talking. It's that he's guest. Portal, um, to other worlds. So all the Fujus and the standing stones up on the, the moors at, at Zenor make Stonehenge look like a suburban bungalow, um, to be honest. Um, there's whole cities up there and there's a lot of people uh, attracted to Zenor, not only artists and writers, but also occultists, uh, apart from Lawrence's crowd. It's always been a centre of witchcraft, and it still is. There's a lot of folklorists, um, occultists who uh, have tracked in the fact that there's a lot of shape-shifting going on on, on that uh, coffin path, which runs by the end of my garden. I've actually witnessed shape-shifting in, in Zeno um, on at least one or two occasions. Zeno really is, is one of those places that, that everybody goes to um, to experience um, 
not only a connection with nature but a connection to, to deeper forces that are very represented in the landscape. So there was a witch of Trevik Treva, which is the village next to me, where in the 19th century it was documented by um, a folk, folkologist and also lots of talk about it, that, that she could transform into a hare, run across the field, uh, you know, five mile to St Ives to get, get food and things, and then come back and then transport back. So the, the path at the end of my garden is... Hang on a second. So there was a witch who would transform into a hare to go on five miles to get food. <laughs> go and do her groceries. How did she get the groceries back if she's a freaking don't, hare? Don't ask logical <laughs> questions, Ben. You're ruining Do it. Do the groceries shrink down? Yes. Like, does the clearly. rabbit have a little grocery bag? Yes. Does obviously. it have a little backpack? Probably not. And that. when That's she bit... shape shifts back to a human, do the groceries change and, when, and well, slides? When she shape shifts well? back, you hear this doom, 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 kind of like Nintendo style, and then she's back. Or do the groceries go into another dimension, like a storage dimension? I oh, know you're just being silly. Is the witch's path? It all links up, of course, to, to, to Freemasonry ritual. You know, Freemason, a lot of Freemasonry ritual is is, is effectively um, Baphomet worship. Um, you know, and bunny shopping Baphomet is a <laughs> is a light motif for a lot of these. Um, people's lives and their belief systems and and their art as well and uh, including Lawrence and, and and Crowley of course who turned himself Baphomet it's I'm, gonna say, I'm gonna say word uh, Alf, uh, Alfred Alfred yeah, Draconis were they summoning them yeah well I, I've I've heard stuff about this uh, but there are rumors and, uh, and I don't disbelieve them that that, that Zenor because of it, the energy in the landscape and because of the the incredible magnetic charge that comes through granite now granite is also associated with Lucifer that that Zeno will be the, the fourth, the centre or the energy hub for the Fourth Reich. And the events on May the 22nd in 1938, when Catherine Arnold Forster, who was married to the guy who helped set up the U League of Nations, the United Nations, you know what all that entails. Um, she died under mysterious circumstances in this cottage, supposedly being summoned by a young couple who were, who were living there, who reported weird things going on outside. Now, those weird things were things moving around outside this cottage there's the most incredible network of ancient stones cities uh, that you don't know how they got there other than the fact that cities the say that's, that's the um, the giants of cornwall used to throw them around the hillside anyway there's a whole network of stones and that's where crowley and a lot of other occultists used to go and do um magic rituals um one of the rumors was, was burning that up an eight foot um draco reptoid um with horn wings and um, oh, you know that was that was part of that that reptoid belief system, um, and that that she immediately had a heart attack. And now, but he also <laughs> had the ability to give people heart attacks remotely because he didn't need to be in the place where he was doing ritual killings. And that, of course, is something that was developed by the CIA and um, MK Ultra and everything. We all so know. I had to clip it there, but that is. That is just a little taste of eight hours of nonstop schizo I rambling. I love it though, how these people <laughs> regard like, and this is not me having a go at it, but I just love it that you can just keep going. Like he just can keep going. Like it just, he never stops. It's just like, oh yeah, well, you know, he was remotely causing heart attacks and then this, you know, weird demon came up out of the ground and then it was like, you know, attacking people. And then, you know, oh yeah, don't forget the League of Nations. And of course, you know, you know how that yeah. turns out. I'm like, mate, take a breath. Dude, that's... <laughs> That's like, it was hard work to get that to be succinct. Like, he could see my edits there. I can. And I was wondering, was that you editing it or was that him? No, that's no. me editing it. And there's another clip I had, which I won't play, but it's it's basically him saying that this whole area in Cornwall was the UK's um, proto-Montauk and that he was one of the Montauk boys uh, see, it's in England, how it, like in England's Montauk. See how, though, with this stuff, um, it often comes back to it being a very narcissistic kind of like, I was part of it. Like every time, every time you hear these wild stories, there's always like, I was somehow involved in it. All right, I'm just going to play William Sargent, who was high up in the British Psychological Association, he was doing experiments that, that led on to Tavistock and uh, MKUltra. One of the guys he was working with um, was Dr. Ewan Duncan Cameron. Now, Cameron um, was one of the people in the 50s when I was growing up and I explained the tests that were, were done on, on people like me and all the other children, the working class children, which they just see as guinea pigs for their testing. I subsequently control. found out a lot about other people involved who I've also known in life who were involved in these various agendas. 
Um, he was put in uh, sleep deprivation. Uh, he'd have sleep rooms where they'd analyze sleep patterns. And they were also, they would put, you know, strap you into to mechanical heads, just like they were doing at the same time in Montauk with the uh, the Montauk boys. Well, Duncan Cameron in that. Yeah, well, that's the same Duncan Cameron. Uh, the same Duncan. Same Duncan Cameron. So, you know, when I say about these jigsaws and when I say how I gather information, so then suddenly I've got the missing link. So Robert Graves was an expert on many things. And one of the experts expertise that he had was was medieval uh, communal rituals in Mexico. He only had that experience because he'd, he'd never been to Mexico, but he could time travel to Mexico and he could time travel back in time. So <laughs> it's so funny. Like he just rambles on, he gets onto some other guy and yeah, he's an expert on Mexican medieval psilocybin. But it just happens to be because he time travels but there to get the information. He time travels there but then he gave that information to the CIA and then the CIA used that to create MK Ultra, but never gave him credit for it. And he's like, he always, he always regretted it. It's like, he just wanted to time travel and get mushroom information and the CIA I, <laughs> abused it. It's I, hilarious. I know we're making light of people that come up with these stories, but the problem is I wouldn't be surprised in the least if there was some type of clandestine government program that was exploiting, you know, working class people or, you know, like utilize, especially back in the 60s. And so I wouldn't be surprised. The problem is, though, that the people describing this, they come up with stories about Mexican history time travelers and connections to the CIA. It just, it just doesn't make sense. Well, it that's too crazy. That's why I've ordered the book, Zen or Spirit of Place by Bob Osborne. It should be coming soon. Coming up on a future plus episode of Mysterious Universe. Speaking of which, that's a wrap for this free edition of MU. We've got plus coming up. Uh, remind us what you've got coming up in the extension. We are going to be going into Haunted War Tales. This is a book published by R.C. Bramhall. Uh, and funnily enough, we will be talking about alleged portal zones mm. uh, throughout the world where strange activity has been taking place. But more so, I'm going to focus on uh, some of the more, uh, I guess, obscure reports of encounters with things like rock apes, weird creatures during wartime uh, and other associated phenomena. So that's all coming up right after this. Call head to mysteriousuniverse.org forward slash plus. Sign up today. Get, you get access to these big extensions we do every single Friday. And if you sign up for Plus, you get an exclusive show every single Tuesday as well. You're getting more than double the content if you sign up for our Plus membership. Plus members also get a entirely ad-free version of the show. For our audio version, you get a, a higher quality feed, you get a higher quality MP3. And uh, if you sign up for MU Max, you get access to our entire back catalog going back 16, 17 years worth of shows, all available at mysteriousuniverse.org. Sign up today. Check it out. Mysteriousuniverse.org forward slash plus. That's a wrap for this free edition of the show. Thanks for listening. If you're on plus, stick around for the great stuff after the break. For everyone else, we'll catch you next week.